Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Um, last we uh, I was here actually at, uh, two three weeks ago, and we talked. We started the subject about the spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare, which uh, it, it sounds a bit well. Why do we talk about war here? Yeah. We are peaceful people. We are Christians, and uh, we, what, what we know is peace. But this is a side of our life that sometimes we omit or we don't give enough attention to, which is a great fact that we have to be aware of. I think um, I cannot remember who was here or who were not there last time. But anyway, quickly we'll touch on what we did last time. <clears throat> Rule number one so long as we live in flesh on this world, we are in a constant warfare. With constant war. <clears throat> uh, especially if we belong to God. If we are called the children of God or the disciples of the Lord, whatever you call it. If you are named Christian and a true Christian, true believer, you are constantly in a warfare. And the question is, what kind of war it is? Who is the enemy? And how am I fighting this war? And can I predict the outcome of the war or not? And these questions I'll touch on quickly before we move into the main subject of today. Because today I think I promised that we will move uh, or talk about how we win the war, how we fight the war and how we win the war. Number one, we need to know that this war is um, already decided, the outcome of it is already known, is already decided. And is decided for our benefit, for us. So it's victorious war. We know before we, uh, we are aware in it or aware of it that victory is ours. We're triumphant and the outcome is in our favor. Fine. Does that mean that I am complacent? I do not think about it. That's what we will know today. The second point that we need to know who is the enemy and where is the battlefield and how am I fighting that war? The answer to these questions is from here. So from the Bible itself, it tells us that we are in a constant warfare and it tells you and me who is the enemy. Who is the enemy? Last time we touched on that and we said the main enemy or the, 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 the maestro of this warfare against us is a person or a personality or whatever you call it, a being called the devil. We've agreed on that. But he has got a lies, has got uh, things or uh, elements that he would work with or work uh, um, uh, in alliance with in order to fight the war, trying to win, but he will never win. What are these allies? So if we mention four big enemies, we said the big one, the maestro, is the devil. We can talk about two or three others, according to the Bible, yeah, that helping this big enemy to attack us and perhaps, I hope not of course, win. I don't think he will. So, if I ask you a question, who were there? Yeah, <coughs> Marina, you were here last time. Who are these allies? One of them is? The angels that fell. The, these are his kind of army. Yes. But he uses things from around us that he can actually fight the war. Otherwise, he will not succeed. There is something, one important thing that he works on, and if we can get... The uh, eye. Mm. The eye. Mm? I. The eye. The eye is the trigger. You press the button on the eye, you can win the battle. No, I think he means like, remember when we were talking about... Um, yeah, yeah. Like, the letter I, like I. Yeah, I know, like I know. Oh. But the I, that ego, that self thing, the pride, is a trigger. He, a button that he presses that, and if he touches that in you, he will, he can win a battle if, if it works for him. But yes, wh where is the I? The flesh. Thank you. The flesh. And this is 
that body of sin that we have, that nature that is already corrupt in us, he's working on that. Okay? So he, this is the key board for him to play on. So that's number one. The other thing is an outside factor that works on you through your flesh, maestered or manipulated by the devil to win battles or to get through his war. Which is? Temptations. Let's see St. James's epistle. The chapter 4, verse 4. Whoever has got the first, just say it. Mm. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Say that again, yeah. Adulterers and adulteresses. And still following you after that. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Yeah, friendship <coughs> with the world, enmity to God. So that ally is the world. So he'll use the world around you, which will work on the old being, the flesh, to win the battle. And put it, give it an example, plenty of temptations from the world. All the, the, the ideology that is completely different from what we, we believe in. Completely bizarre ideologies coming up, like waves, and very easily convince people if you're not careful, you get uh, um, swept, away. swept away by it. Correct? That's true. All the temptations. I personally, I'm still in the, I go out sometimes, get tempted. Oh yes, I want to do this and that, uh, buy this and that. The possessions, all, the, all in the world. And that's why when the Lord was tempted by the devil, that was one of the three major areas of temptation that he was exposed to, correct? Mm. Possessions, the world. Okay. So two main things now. And then the third one, which is the ultimate. This is the, the final enemy which will get conquered at the end, is death. We got them now. So the devil up there, yeah, playing through the world and the flesh to get us into death. And I hope we will not, never, will never reach that. We are here for eternity, for eternal life. Okay? So that is the, the, the enemy in very quick summary. And we said last time, we, 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 we talked about where did we learn about the, the devil in the Bible. We talked about chapter 14 of the book of Isaiah, chapter uh, 28 of the book of Ezekiel, and how we, he was described as the, an archangel who had all the gifts, was really a, a glorious being, but a creation, a, a, a created being, not a creator. Okay, so he, although he tried to put himself equal or above God, who created him, but after all, he is, he was created. Okay, so that is an important thing for us to learn, to not to be afraid of fighting the war, which will come to it in a moment. Yeah, and we, we said, well, for simplification, and as Michael just reminded me now, we remember when we read through the book of Isaiah, what dragged the devil himself down from being an archangel with all the glory, we read through the word, or the, the letter, I. Yeah? I will do, I will raise myself above, and so on. And five times he mentioned that. And for you to remember, we said there are five ways he can actually attack you with. Do you remember them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Say just titles like that. Indifference. Indifference. Ignorance. Uh -huh. I'm reading this. <laughs> Infiltration. <It's great>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Intimidation and intervention. Intervention. Okay. Indifference. <coughs> indifference. Must me make you indifferent to his existence, to him. This, you, know, you, you kind of don't get that. Whatever they say, these in the churches and the meetings like that. Absolutely. Come on. Do you believe in these things? So you ignore it, become indifferent to it. Hmm? And that is 
how any clever enemy can attack, make you uh, unaware of his existence or his strength or his strategy and so on. And the second one is ignorance. And again, you become ignorant of all these powers that's surrounding you, how they work, how they function, what the, 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 the ways they can use to attack you and so on. If you're ignorant of it, you cannot defend yourself. But also you become ignorant of what's available to you to fight the war, which we will learn today. Yeah, so the ignorance is important. And the third point is, infiltration base probably is the worst bit. And because we hold the tap for that infiltration business, if we have certain things or certain behaviors or certain uh, uh, practices that can open gaps or holes in your wall, in the wall that surrounds you to protect you, and through which the devil will infiltrate through. We had examples, didn't we? And a quick example of sins that I practice and become part of me, part of my nature, and that I never repent or confess them, so they stay there, and this is a weak point for the devil to enter through, into me through, yeah? And another one is other practices that I, we, we said and we had a discussion about it, I'm quite happy to have more discussion about it today, is the uh, witchcraft and the black magic, reading palms, reading the stars, and all these sort of uh, uh, superstitious practices. That is a very dangerous area through which the devil can sneak in and you're smiling because probably you've got many questions about it <laughs> that we can answer, yeah? So the other thing is how the devil will, the, 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 the number four is, I think, was it intimidation? Which, how, you, how the devil will intimidate you? By making you feel little. I'm not worthy, I cannot fight it, I'm so weak, how can I compare myself with the devil with these powers that I cannot see? I'm still in flesh, and uh, I'm, if I'm in flesh, I cannot actually, every time I fall, I, I, I cannot get up. And all these th things that will intimidate you, condescend you, and make you feel gradually get into despair. This is one of the worst weapons or ways he uses to get you in. Right? And then after that, we talked a little bit about the invasion. How, by ways of uh, uh, being busy in your life, whether it's social, work, or even, I said, even the church. A lot of us, and uh, people, a lot of us, and in fact, is not in, uh, in serving in the church. Serving in the church itself. I'm not saying that don't serve, don't misunderstand me. But... <laughs> If you get dragged away, because it gives you a, a, a sense of satisfaction and uh, I'm happy with myself, I'm doing the right thing. And you get dragged in, in, oh yes, doing this and that, it's so busy. And you don't have time or space in your thoughts or feelings to sit with God one-to-one -one and have that uh, kind of personal relationship with Him. It's very easy. It happens, and I've seen it. And it maybe I tell you what? Shall I confess? I, it's, it's recording me. It happened to me at some point in my life. Yeah, and you've got to be aware of it. Man. So these are quickly the five ways. And we said his objective is three Ds. Uh, I'm just trying to make you remember. Although uh, and the three Ds were he's always trying to. Uh, 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 deceive you, uh, divide you, and ultimately destroy you. So the deception and the division, and division is well known amongst churches, within the same church, even amongst uh, friends like this, and so on. It's very uh, good tactics from him to divide the children of God. Yeah, you know that on a bigger scale and a smaller scale. Bigger scale when the church is all divided, and we had now a lot of denominations, and uh, we call them Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, over here and there, many of them. Yes. This is perhaps the biggest uh, blow to the church ever happened 
in history is dividing the church. And also it can happen on a very smaller, smaller scale. In our church, even in the family itself, in the one family can find a brother or sister fighting together, or divided in thoughts, or feelings, and so on. So be aware that that's what he is trying to do. Because once he is, it succeeds and uh, he is easy to move on, ultimately he would, life, uh, would like to destroy you. Destroy you means that you lose your eternal life, you lose your relationship, you lose your salvation. And that's another question perhaps comes to some of our minds. Is it possible for a good believer to lose his salvation? I'm not answering that now because this is not the topic of today. Okay? But that ultimate goal of the devil is to destroy us. Will he have the chance? Of course not. And we'll see how. How we fight the war and guarantee that we are winning, because it's already won on our behalf. So basically, I don't need to fight myself, but I need to dress myself in a certain way, we call it the armor of God, yes? And if I'm dressed that way, I'm very easily defending my position, and not only defending, I'm also fighting or attacking. Attacking, okay? We will see how. There are other elements in it, but this is pro probably the focus of today, and I will build around. Before we move into that, I read with you, and because we need to know that what we are fighting, we are fighting a very well-organized enemy. Very well-organized enemy. And a fearful, powerful enemy. Don't underestimate him, or his powers, or his allies. Let's read from, i read two things. One part, which is the, the main part that we will discuss today in details. Another part, we'll read it together to a little, put you in the pictures. I'm not going to scare you, but to put you in the picture. Okay? We're not going to scare, be scared today. I think we'll be walking out of here today confident triumphant okay even if you came in a little bit shaky unsure you walk out of here hundred percent sure that's how I feel he is under my feet and yours okay let's read together Ephesians chapter 6 okay uh, who, who feels like reading loudly today uh, from verse 10 to verse 19. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil of, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the, best, the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is in the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to, his end, to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Okay? Okay, shall we start here? <coughs> Have you noticed something while you're reading there? When he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, which we've agreed at the beginning. When it comes to flesh and blood, we're the most peaceful beings on earth, Christians. Correct? So, we've got war, but we don't fight the war as the world understand it. We don't fight that. We don't do that. Okay? Our wrestling or our war is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting human <coughs> beings. In fact, we love them. 
We don't have enemies from the human beings. That's why the Lord says, love your enemies. And I, I think we talked about that before, how you love your enemies. The enemies that you don't feel enemy against is the ones that think that you are their enemies. That's what he means. You with me? So that's what, who you love. We don't have enemies. I don't have anyone inside that I have bitterness or any hard feelings against. No matter how bad they treat me. We agree on that as a principle. So we don't fight flesh and blood. But what do, what do we fight here? What did he say? Paul actually revealed something very important for us. He, he says, flesh against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Have you seen something here? Have you noticed something? There is a word we use it. Hierarchy. hierarchy. Yeah? So... It tells you something, yeah, that there is a hierarchy in that kingdom. There's a kingdom, very well organized, and I think we touched on that last time, and they've got hierarchy, levels, because they're very well organized. So, be careful when we fight the war, that we should be as organized, or even better. I tell you, uh, let's, re let's read another, just to re-emphasize that point be before we leave it. Because the topic of today is the following paragraph. <coughs> but not to scare you, but to show you part of the truth or what, what surrounds us. Let's read a little bit from the book of Daniel, chapter 10. Of course, we all know Daniel, a great man of God, who was called by God himself the Beloved. Three times, and, and yeah, when the angel came to talk to him, he talked to him. He says, "Beloved," once in chapter nine, twice in chapter ten. But we will read a little bit in chapter ten. And that actually, this chapter of the the, the, the Holy Bible is a very important one because it gives us an idea about this world which is not visible to us. Right, let's read, just to read a couple of, I don't want to take a lot of time from you, because we will need to go back into our main topic. Let us read uh, uh, from verse 1 to 3, and then I'll read a little bit after that <coughs> later. So, Merna, in the third year of Cyrus. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Bilti Shazar. Mm -hmm. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message, and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Thank you. So you notice here what Daniel was doing? He was praying, mourning, and fasting on behalf of his people, the Israelites, for three continuous weeks. No answer yet to his prayers. But let us see what happened. Uh, let's read from verse 10 until 14. And that will give you an idea of what's happening there. Anyone who's ready to read? Okay. Huh? Yeah? Yeah. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand these the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, 
your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Is that carry on? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Now I have come to make you understand that what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Okay. Uh, just connect the two parts that we read together, and we'll see what we understand from them. First of all, the first part is Daniel was feeling uh, sorrow for his people, praying hard, spending three weeks praying, fasting, mourning, and he was waiting for the answer. Then, finally, the answer came in, in that part that we read together now, and did you notice something? Who answered him? It was an angel called Gabriel and came to tell him what happened since when the prayers of Daniel was heard thank you day one so why the response to his prayers did not happen from day one it's been three weeks the answer is there have you noticed that what what happened what delayed things no. Uh, uh, but read 13, 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia with stood me twenty one days. Do you know what it means? The king of Persia, not the human being. He's not talking about the human. This is an angel. Of course, the human being, the the, the human king, is not the one standing before the angel to fight him. An angel can kill thousands and thousands, and we know that from the book of Isaiah, many, many areas in the Bible tells that one angel can kill a lot. But here he's talking about that the spirit, the evil spirit, hmm, that is allocated to look after Persia. So the devil, you have, and I'm reading that to you to understand how this world that is invisible to us is working. It's very well organized, very powerful. But see what happened? And then Gabriel himself couldn't do that on his own until Michael, the archangel, came to give him a hand, to help him. Eventually, yes, they overcome him and they, he came to tell Daniel, don't worry, your prayers are heard. But he told him something as well later on, that when after I leave you, I'm going to fight the prince or the, the, the king of Greece. And it's, I think it is, yeah, here we are. When I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. So, 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 from one battle to the other. Where is that? Can we see it? In the heavenly, as Paul mentioned. So the fight is not here. The fight is not materialistic. It is in the other areas surrounding, in the heaven. You agree with that? Understood it? Scary? A little bit. But there's something hmm, to reassure us that what we have with us is more than what they have against us. We had an example from the Bible. I'm, I don't want to because the time can, we can spend hours in that. But uh, do you remember Elijah? Hmm? Not Eli Elijah, Elijah, his, his disciple. When he had a, there was a fight with, from the Aram, Aramaic, I think, against Israel, and his servant, or his disciple, was with him, and he was really scared because he saw all that army coming at once. And he prayed to God, he says, open his eyes to see what I can see. So Aisha was really cool, calm, no problem, happy, peaceful. He didn't care because he could see what we couldn't see. And God gave that gift to that disciple, opened his eyes, and he saw the thousands and thousands of angels fighting the war on their behalf. So what we have, and he told him, what we have with us is more than what they have against us. Fine. So as a principle, there is a, a complete world that we don't see, very powerful, is happening, and the fight is ongoing. How I can form part of that world and be effective 
and the, the, the triumph is mine, or the, the vic victory is mine. That's what we will learn today. Question. Yeah. Um, a war suggests that there's an, an equal chance of winning on either side, and I would expect like the angels and, and wouldn't need like there is no war when anything is put up against God's side, they would instantly fail. Wouldn't you? I can't imagine there being a war and and Gabriel being delayed twenty one days because of a almost the devil. I feel like. Where's God in the mix of it? Is well, he's there. His he's angels. there, but the, the, it's not just a habracadabra like this. It's a true war. And that's what the message from here is. It, it, God is there, and his powers are far, far more superior than the other powers, but it exists, and it needs an effort, as it happened here. So why is there? Mm. Can what? I add a question? To mm. uh, the question will answer. Uh, so you make life easy for me. No, I'll make it more complicated. Right. Actually, does Daniel himself have got a rule in that? Uh, does Daniel what? Sorry? Does Daniel have a part in that war or yeah. not? I mean, if yeah. Gabriel is fighting with the devil to come to Daniel to tell him a message, yeah. does he have a part in that, or just he's he prayed and he's negative now, and the war is happening there yeah. and they're coming there? That question. <laughs> Is, is going to be answered as we talk together about our weapons. Yeah? Of course we had a lot. And I, I have an opinion about that. Remind me to mention it at the end about what Danny, whether Daniel had to pray and fast for 20, all the 21 days, or maybe if he did it for a day or two was enough because his prayers were heard from the first day. I think we'll answer that at the end. And I hope you answer it before I do. Is that okay? I'm, right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just a bit confused because I don't understand why, like, the angels don't have to fight, uh, kind of like the same struggle we are fighting because they they don't have a death to conquer and they kind of are already in spiritual places. I don't I don't see what they're fighting or why they're fighting. Yeah. That, maybe that will answer is. the first question as well. Okay. We are. Yeah. the target for both sides if we say what are the major powers in this world how many major powers is it the United States the, the, the Russia or uh, of course not two main major powers but by far one is much higher than the other is God's power and the devil's power but the target for these two powers is us, is the human being. God, because of his immense love to us, wants us to be with him and enjoy living and loving him eternally. The devil, because he knew his destiny, is predestined, and he knew that from the day he fell, he wanted to drag us and make a loss for God through us. So any, any soul that is lost to him is actually is a loss from the kingdom of God. So that's how it, the fight is. We are the focus of this fight. You got it? So the angels, answering your question, are fighting the fight With. for us. Right. So when, when Gabriel saying uh, 21 days, is that referring to... But Daniel, it was a fight. Daniel was like being occupied or tempted by the devil. No, no, Daniel tempted. No, Daniel wanted an answer to what happens to his people because right. that this it happened to Daniel at the end of the seventy years that they they spent in captivity. So he knew from the prophecies, especially the book of Jeremiah, that the seventy years has been prophesied are due now. So he was praying, where, where is the end? I'm waiting for it to happen because you said... So he was crying and praying and repenting on behalf of his people for God to fulfill his promise and get them back to the promised land after the 70 years of activity. So that's what Daniel was doing. Yeah? We'll go back to that in a minute. Uncle, if I may comment on yes, my yeah, question. Yeah. Um, th th there is a reason and a logic behind 
everything that God allows to happen, mm. and especially behind time, as Michael was asking, mm. you know, why mm. three weeks, mm. that we may not understand straight away, but there is a plan for it. I mean, God could have sent uh, Michael to help him after just one week. Mm. But uh, I don't know about that, Ram. I yeah. cannot. It, it's very clearly said here that he was fought back and resisted and it took him up to three weeks and in fact he couldn't overcome that resisting force until Michael came to give him a hand. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I mean, the, the reason that timing it could have been two weeks, four weeks, yeah. the, the timing is from him. It's, it's his wisdom. You can, can say that. What the, the message I was trying to get to you from here is don't underestimate this power. Don't underestimate what happens that we don't see. Okay? But we come to that, and it is just an example of how these uh, uh, powerful beings exist and work. Anyway, back to our topic, how we fight the war. And again, as was Diana reading through from the, uh, the passage to the Ephesians, Paul here gave us the description of the complete, we call it complete armor of God. And he divided into, how, have, you, have you counted how many pieces? Have you, anyone? I guess. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, uh. Say seven. Yeah. Seven? Okay, can you mention them? Very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like the word, the number, don't you? I just, yeah. Yeah. It's just a lottery. <laughs> yeah. how, how many have you counted, Marna? So far, I'm on four. Yeah. Let's, uh, shall we read them together? Okay. Hmm? First of all, gird you gird, you waste with the truth. Okay. So the girdle of truth. Breastplate of righteousness, that's number two. Six. Feet with preparation of the gospel of peace, three. Shield of faith, four. What else? Helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation, that's five. And sword of spirit. Six. Six, is that? Yes. Okay. All right, let's talk about the six, but there is a seventh one. <laughs> but I'll tell you about the faith. All right. <laughs> Back <to guess>. Back <laughs> <to guess. laughs> right. First, let's take them one by one. The girdle of truth. This is how. What, that's what your role as a soldier in the army of God, winning or entering a war that you know that you are definitely hundred percent winning. But you have to put dress up like that. Paul here took that description from the time that they lived in, which is at the Roman Empire time, and the Roman soldier used to dress in a certain way, and that's how the Roman soldier used to prepare himself before going to war. They used to dress with a long garment, and if you don't lift it up, it's too long that you can trip, yeah. So you have to lift it up and fold it over with like a belt, a girdle, and he called it here, the girdle of truth. And the reason for that is that for you as a man of Christ or a disciple, true disciple of Christ, you've got to be honest, truthful, faithful, not biased to anything, and a straightforward person. And the reason for that, if you deviate from any of these, you are actually very likely to because one sneaky way can lead you to big holes here and there, stumble here and there. Imagine yourself starting one lie, but just saying one lie. It could lead to a, a series of other problems, other sins, not only lies, other things. So, truth and living in the truth is very important to ease your path to facilitate your walk. You cannot be like this and walk easily because you will trip over your garment. 
Okay? That's the girdle of truth. That's number one. Number two, and that's important, he says the breastplate of where is the breastplate for a soldier? Where does he put it on? And he protects what? The, the heart and <laughs> the lungs. Yeah, and mainly, mainly the heart. Correct. Eh? <laughs> what did he say? You don't know. It's good that you don't know. You know the heart, don't you? I know the heart. Yeah, that's the <laughs> main thing. So the, the breastplate <laughs> of righteousness. So why righteousness will protect your heart? Why? It's very important because the heart is the pump that sends blood over to keep you alive. Without that, we're not, we're not here anymore. Correct? If the heart stops, we're not there. So we have to protect the most important organ of our body. So why righteousness protects the heart? Why righteousness is a breastplate? And what kind of righteousness? Righteousness means I'm righteous, correct? Means I'm doing all the righteous things, I'm doing everything right. Simple English. Is that what is meant here? How many of you, if I ask a question including myself, Hani, are you righteous by yourself? Uh, I say, I think, I don't think I think actually, because I know the answer. Why myself? I'm never 100% righteous, am I? There is not a single person in this, even this, the, the, we call them saints or uh, holy men or whatever, still have iniquities, have difficulties, have sins and so on. So what kind of righteousness he's talking about here? In fact, if you put on your own righteousness, that is like putting a shirt like that and exposed to all the darts that are coming against you straight into the heart. That's my righteousness. Nothing. But the breastplate, which is an iron thing, really solid, bounce back any arrows coming against. This is the righteousness that I need to put on. And I need, I want you to know which type of righteousness we are talking about. And I, uh, if I ask you to open the book of I, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 61 and verse, I think 12 or something like that, yeah? Mm, who's quick enough? You know, I think now you should flick through the Bible right and left easily like that. No problem, no difficulty. Yeah? Uh -huh. 61. And, and verse 10. Mm, who's reading? I will greatly rejoice yeah. in the Lord. Mm. My soul shall shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, yeah. and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Okay, so where is the righteousness here? The robe of righteousness. Who puts it on you? God. What kind of righteousness? God. His. So we have, we dress the righteousness of Christ. How? Because we believe in Him, we subject and submit to Him. So we take His righteousness upon us. You know, when we're covered by the blood of the Lord, it has to protect us because what God, Father, sees, it will see Christ in you and me. So the righteousness that I'm wearing as a breastplate to protect my heart protect the most important organ for me to give me life is the righteousness of Christ, not my own righteousness. Easy? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that one? So the second piece, isn't that? This is the second piece. And he said something as well, and, and, and Paul himself in the second book, the uh, epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. He says here, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We, you, me, become the righteousness of God 
In whom? In him. Who's him? Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah? Our Lord. You see? The second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. You got it? Yeah? So he took our sin. We Some kind of exchange happened. Yeah? Give and take. We gave him something so bad. He gave us something so good. Give us, gave him our sins. We took from him his righteousness. So we became protected. Fine, great. But also, if you are wearing the breastplate of righteousness, it is an important defending piece of the armor of God against the devil because the devil is the accuser. He keeps accusing us in front of God. He's a sinner. He did that. He's bad. He's got full of iniquities. And so on. Accusing, accusing, accusing. But if we dress that, God will see what? Straight into me. He'll see Christ who is without sin, without blemish. So he cannot accuse you anymore. That's an important thing. So the dart that he will use and the breastplate will protect you against is accusation. Yes? Third one. What's the third piece? Yeah. The feet. The problem with the feet is that, you know, the soldier in the past, he used to wear, have you seen pictures, you know, drawing diagrams? Of how they wear it with this uh, laces that these straps around the leg and really ugly looking but uh, very good in the way that they help them to walk long distance and protect the sole of their feet. These sandals or these certain shoes for the soldiers, very important when they enter a war because they spend days and days and they don't take them off. In fact, in, 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 wherever you go in war, even the, the, the modern days, and I remember myself when I was in the uh, army as if you know I spent a few weeks in there the first beginning you know they train you and that kind of thing which is was, wasn't very good days for me at all I wasn't prepared for it and the one of the tasks that they give you as to train you is to uh, guard uh, a certain uh, target they call it so you're guarding this protecting it you're the guard here and you spend overnight Guiding. And uh, you exchange with uh, your colleagues, you sleep two hours and come back and so on, until the night is over. I didn't take it seriously, but I noticed something that I'm not allowed to take my shoes off in even my two hours break. I sleep with my shoes on. So, what's the importance here? For the true believer, for you and me, having, what do you call it? Shoes of what? Lost of what? Peace. Why is that? Why is the gospel? The gospel is the peaceful message, isn't that? We know that. Hmm? The message of joy to everybody. But for me, my gospel is the source of peace for me. So it is protecting my feet when I walk the way, I walk the path. Whatever happens around me, whatever, anything that is trying to hurt me will not get through. Because my peace overcomes, even I, if I receive any uh, 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 bad comments, bad feelings from the others, uh, I can actually, my peace will overcome that and I will not be disturbed. So it's very important. But also, as I have that shoes of the gospel of peace all the time, myself I'm showing to the others the source of my power, yeah, my protection all the time. So that is the, uh, the, 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 the shoes of the gospel of peace. Another point is when Peter in his first uh, epistle says that, but something the Lord got in you, uh, in your heart, uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> sanctify the Lord God in your uh, hearts and always be ready to give defense 
to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with weakness and fear. So always be prepared to answer the secret behind our hope, the secret behind our peaceful life. Why we're so peaceful? It's not because we are uh, very weak and uh, helpless, no. In fact, we are very powerful, very, very powerful. But our peace is from the Prince of Peace, from our God, from our Savior. Yeah? Okay. This is the... How many now? Four. Four. No, four. Three. Four. Or what the fourth? Hmm? What's the fourth then? Hmm. Shield of faith. Ah. Oh. Afina was shield? Huh? You know what the shield is? Uh, has, have you seen it? And, you know, the, 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 the breastplate is part that is dressed that way, okay? The shield is the, the, the soldier will stand and hold it that way and it covers from his toes up to the head. That's the shield. The shield of faith is the piece of the... Um, you're worried about the video, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to stay in that position. <laughs> Don't stand up. <laughs> the shield of faith <laughs> is the part that protects all your body against the fiery darts all your body it's very important because the shield of faith my faith in God my faith in my saviour my faith in my protection and, and belief 100% that I am a witness it's very important and the, the doubt here is a hole in your shield okay so you've got to have a strong steadfast faith why is that and the, the key to that you remember when we said the breastplate protects us against the devil accusing uh, accusing us standing against us accusing us in front of God you know what the shield will protect you against that in, fa in fact, the, the shield defends God in, in your eyes. I'll give you an example. It sounds a bit harsh. My faith tells me when I'm in difficulty, God has not forsaken me. Because sometimes, I think, and some of us will do, Oh God, why are you forsaken me? Why are you left me? Where is God here? I'm going through difficult times and I can't feel you. And so on. If my faith is strong, I wouldn't think that. That's the faith. Yeah? So, because who is whispering in your ears to tell you that God has forsaken you? Yeah, the devil. That's how he trying to accuse God in front of your eyes. Hmm? Yeah. But your faith he is defending that. It's bouncing back these accusations. So it's the other way around. Yeah? So the breast bit of righteousness protecting you, shield the faith defending God because I believe in him I will never doubt him yeah he will he's with me all the time and I will be answered in due time and we had the example of Daniel his prayers are answered from or yeah. I'll tell you later bro. yeah <laughs> right so when I read the two verse together the one from the Ephesians and the one from the Thessalonians I understood he's talking about the hope because my salvation is, 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 is there for me. I'm hoping, not hoping in the hope that it could happen, couldn't happen, but I'm hoping that means that I'm sure 100%. That's what I'm waiting for, is my salvation. So this is protected. Don't worry. No matter what happens around you, your thoughts focus on there. Yes? Because that's where you are going to. And your salvation is there for you. And that's why I don't like people when they start, when I ask them, and again, some, uh, some people get provoked by me with that. Actually, when I ask, if I ask you, do you know where you're going? If we go now, you know, leave this world, where are we going? And see, some people say, I don't know, maybe. Some people say, I'm, I'm a sinful person, I probably will go the other way. <laughs> It's very shocking. I've got our own book today. <laughs> very shocking. You know that? For, for children of God to answer this answer is very shameful. 
And I think it is actually, it breaks his heart for all what he did to you. And you are not sure that you are saved by him. Not because you're good, not because we are uh, uh, righteous in ourselves, but because clinching on him, holding him all the way through, he's leading us and he's definitely, he knows the way, he's taking us there. He says that in the house of my father, many mansions. And they've gone, I'm going there to prepare one for you. Didn't he say that? Yeah. So when, always ask yourself that question to get the answer, yes, I know where I'm going. Not to get the answer that I'm not sure. Okay? I don't know if you agree or disagree with me. Hmm? Don't say I, I'm not sure. But if you feel that you're not, you're saying you're not sure because you're, you've got a sin or you're not really, you, you feel weakness, go and put yourself under his feet and pray and he will actually strengthen you. He will convert your weakness into power. That's, that is how I feel. If I am feeling that I've been overcome by a certain sin that I cannot get rid of, all what you need is to make a decision that you don't want it in your life anymore and go to Him who will give you the power to completely overcome that weakness. You with me? But don't say, I'm not sure. Because I don't think He'll like it. <laughs> He's done it for you. Hmm? All what you need to do, believe it and take it and walk circumspectly as it should be for the call that is being called upon you. Agree? Fine. That is the hope. That's the, the helmet of salvation or the hope of salvation as we the sixth part, which is the last, no, the one before last, and we left the seventh, Michael will tell us about it. Sixth part is Oh, I like the sword. I like the sword. <laughs> The sword of the Spirit, which is it? What's the sword? The Word of God. Many times in the Bible, the Word was described as the sword. Anyone remembers where? One of them? You said something hmm? about the two edged sword. Yeah? Two edged sword, yes? Can you get it out for us, Paddy? Probably, yes. And somewhere else? Anyone else thinks of this? Hmm. You remember where John's seen his last revelation? revelation? Yeah. He saw the Son of God. Yeah. Double edged sword. Yeah? In the book of Revelation. But anyway, have you got that? Mm -hmm. Can you read it for us, please, Barry? Okay. Yeah. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, mm -hmm. piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, mm -hmm. and of joints and marrow, and mm -hmm. is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Le uh, le uh, yeah, you got it? Ah, uh, listen it. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, yeah. but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom okay. we must give it. Yeah. Sorry, Fadi, if I may ask you slowly to read uh, uh, 11 and uh, 12 again. Only 11 and 12. And all of you, please listen to that. And let us see how the sword works. Yeah? Let us mm. therefore be diligent yeah. to enter that rest. Yeah. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Okay. For the word of God is living and powerful. Mm -hmm. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Yes. And of joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yeah. Right. You got it? the word of God if you have got the word of God and always it's uh, inside you is part of you that will happen it will work inside you as a defendant weapon and an attacking weapon at the same time because it will discern through to differentiate the good and the bad thoughts the, 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 the true feelings and the fake ones will differentiate even where the, the intentions and the deeds, because sometimes my intentions are separate from my deeds, are different. So that is the sword, that's the word of God. But he says something here which is very interesting. The sword of the spirit. spirit. It means that the spirit uses the sword 
is the main weapon for the spirit, which is spirit. The Holy Spirit that is working within you, the main weapon in the hand of the spirit is the word of God. Hmm? Is the sword a defending weapon or an attacking weapon? Hmm? Both. It is both. If you see the... the, 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 the Hmm? Defenses. The, 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 I can't remember in English what. Defense. 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 Yes, defense. Defense. yes, yeah, yeah. You see, they can actually defend that way and then attack, don't they? So it's a defending and an attacking weapon. That's the word of God. But there is a, a little thing, little, not problem, but a, a shortcoming of it because if you use it as an attacking weapon, it only reaches as far as the extension of your arm. So we need some artilleries or some powerful weapons that uh, 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 long, reaches long distances, like nuclear heads or something like that. And that is number seven. seven. <laughs> yeah? That is number seven. Which is, have you read it through? Prayer. Thank you. Thank you. These are our <laughs> nuclear heads. And you know what? The right prayer is very precise. You can get the target and send your rocket with the nuclear head on it, and it's very precise and you'll hit it straight away. But we have, when we pray, to hit the target is to pray in or according to the will of God. That's why he says, you ask and you don't get. Because you ask, you don't ask according to the will of God. That's from St. James' passage as well. Yeah? So how many weapons now? Seven. Each of them, very important. You cannot actually fight the war without any of them. And the prayers is the crowning one, is the one that I used to attack. So most of them, or the majority of them apart from the sword, which is, can be used for both, are defendant pieces, but the one that is an attacking weapon is the prayers. So, are we powerful or not now? You got it? We are. Yes, we've read earlier something very scary about how this kingdom works, how it is very well organized, how the principalities, the rulers, the hierarchy, and so on, how they actually, too powerful to the extent that they stopped the angel uh, Gabriel to come to Daniel from the first day. Yes, but our Lord says, I've seen the devil coming down from heaven like, And that triumph is done on our behalf, it's for us. So all what we need is to walk in that parade. But when we walk in the parade, we've got to be completely dressed with the full armor of God. And we know how to use these weapons. Excellent. One more thing before I leave that topic. Have you noticed something when we were putting on the armor of God, one part of your body is not covered. Back. Thank you. We said that before, didn't we? Tell us the back. How come you leave your back uncovered? You shouldn't run away. Mm. You know that in, in the battle, in the old days... Hmm? You've got people next to you. Thank you, know you very much. <laughs> so, you are protecting my back, you're protecting mine, I'm protecting yours, and so on. Because we are standing that way, and that is the fellowship <laughs> in Christ. Because that's the why we need to lift uh, each other up, we protect each other's back from the attacks of the evil ones. You got it? So, don't underestimate your gathering in the name of Christ. Never ever, because he promised. He promised. He says, if two or three gather in my name, I will be where? 
And that's more accurate. Not just amongst them, in the midst. Because his place should be in your life and mine, all of us, in center, in the midst. Yes? Even when he came and visited his disciples after the resurrection, he went when the doors were shut and he stood in. So where is he in your life? In the middle. Is he really? Is he the center of your life? Is he the center of mine? That's the question I need to ask. Because if he is in the center of my life, that means that I am dressed very well with the complete armor of God. I am well protected. I am triumphant. I don't care because I'm winning. And when they ask me, where are you going? I'm going to him. I'm going with him. No, not to him. It's with him because he's already with me here. Hmm? Okay? Questions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. Okay. And they're specifically about um, things that are written in Ephesians 6. Mm. So my first one was, we've talked about how it says um, that we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness mm. of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heaven. Can you please clarify who these powers are? Yeah, they, uh, not, uh, I cannot... Like, who, who are spiritual mm -hmm. hosts of wickedness? Yeah, different denominations of... Uh, Denom yes, levels. Like, you know, in the, in the army, you have a general, you have a sergeant, you have a soldier, don't you? That hierarchy thing, that levels, because all these are fallen angels. Oh. They fell with the devil from the very beginning. So this is his army. And they are divided into in hierarchy. Okay? And there is some little ones called demons as well, which the, the Lord used to deal with and cast them out. Yeah? Are those the spiritual hosts of wickedness? Yeah, probably. Yeah? Okay, I get it. Okay. My the next question was we didn't actually read this far, but if we read on um, mm. to verse 20 in chapter 6, um, it goes on to say, For which I am an ambassador in mm. chains. Mm. Why, why, why am I an ambassador in, in chains? Yeah. Anyone know? He was. He was, he was dragged. It's, it's a double meaning here. Yeah. yeah? He was. Because he was dragged and put to prison and all that several times. Okay. And... Uh, he is nearly there, Ramos. Do you know that four epistles that Paul wrote from his prison in Rome? He was prison the second time before he was decapitated, and he wrote another fifth epistle, which is the second epistle to Timothy. But the four he wrote together when he was in his first prison in Rome was anyone remembers? Ephesians. That's easy, yeah. Philippians. Philippians. No. Flimon, yeah. And another one that has got a quite a lot of verses very similar to the Ephesians. Hebrew. No. Colossians. For he wrote together all at around the same time in prison. So he says, I am an ambassador. He didn't stop being an ambassador working for God, even though he was in chains. That is the physical meaning of that, but also I am, yeah, you can put it that way, spiritual in med in meditation on it, and that I am in chain, in chain with him, and I'm working with him and for him. But here, he meant that he is in true chains when he was in prison, writing this epistle. Okay? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I feel happier when he's not asking, he's always asking difficult ones. <laughs> okay. do you, do you, you got the point today? Can we make sure that we are always putting on complete armor of God and always using that far distance weapon or as I said it in front of the camera, the nuclear heads, <laughs> the prayers, yeah? 
Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.